Hey everybody, it's Gomladex, and welcome back to some more Magic Arena. Today I'll be playing another Tinkerer's Cube Draft. So without further ado, let's discuss our pack one, pick one, shall we? So I think I'm going to go with Archon of Sun's Grace here. There are a lot of great enchantments in this cube, even if you don't have an enchantress theme. And Archon of Sun's Grace, even if you don't manage to cast an enchantment after... Uh, dropping this on the board is still a 4 mana 3 4 flying lifelink. As soon as you've cast one enchantment, you're getting a really good deal out of this card. 4 mana for a 3 4 flying lifelink and a 2 2 Pegasus that has lifelink as long as you control the Archon of Sun's Grace. This card is just a really, really good deal. It's an incredible payoff if you are going for an enchantments deck and a good card nonetheless. I think I'm pretty excited to play Archon of Sun's Grace as the pick one, pack one here. There's some other sweet cards in here. The other card that I'd be willing to first pick would probably be Skull of the Lost Trove. This card has always seemed pretty busted in a lot of the cubes. It is a lot of mana, 7 mana for a 5-5 flyer, but when it enters the battlefield, you can recast an instant sorcery or artifact from your graveyard for free, so that really makes up for the high mana cost of that card. It is always a pretty large game winner and a game ender there. So pick two now. We see some really powerful black cards in here. Not much going on enchantress-wise to go with the Archon of Sun's Grace, although there is a Twisted Embrace, and there's not a ton of removal in the cube, so I suppose that is an option. That being said, I do think Marionette Master is a really sweet finisher. You can play this as a six mana for four six. I know how to do math. And whenever an artifact you control is put into the graveyard from the battlefield, each opponent will lose life equal to its power. So they lose four life whenever you just sacrifice a treasure token or something. So Marionette Master is a pretty sweet finisher. But the Herald of Anguish was also a really sweet finisher. I like both of these black rares in the top left a whole ton. I think they're both incredible cards in general. And they both synergize with a lot of the same stuff, treasure tokens and blood tokens and stuff like that. I think there's some of the strongest cards in here. Iron Crag Pyromancer is really strong if you have a lot of card draw engines. Um, but these are just single-handedly super good. I think maybe I'm supposed to go Marionette Master here, but Herald of Anguish really impressed me in the last deck that we drafted. Anytime we could get this card down, it was always an incredible deal because if your opponent doesn't have instant speed removal or a counter spell, it's a two-for-one guaranteed because you're playing your big threat making them discard a card during your end step, and then they probably have to spend a removal spell on it as well. So really nice, really nice card altogether. Pick three now. We see the Royal Scions, which is really powerful with cards like Iron Crag Pyromancer. It's just a really powerful Planeswalker in general, being five loyalty for three mana, and you can plus one when it hits the board. So Royal Scions is really good in this cube. Gonna be hard to take that after taking a white and then a black card, because it's very unlikely we get to play that and one of these but uh, I think that is the strongest card in this pack. Otherwise, there's some good mana fixing with the Reclusive Taxidermist to tapping for a mana of any color. Works well with some graveyard uh, synergies as well. Just gets bigger once you milled yourself. I guess Kami of Terrible Secrets is theoretically okay if we get artifacts and enchantments, but I'm just going to go with the strongest card. Royal Scions is just absurd. So, pack one, pick four now. We have Vona, Butcher of Megan. That's Almost definitely not how you pronounce it, but uh, it's a 5-mana 4-4 four, four Vigilance Lifelink. You can pay 7 life and tap it to destroy an online permanent. Really, really powerful card if we get on the black-white path. Pick up a lot of life gain to make sure we can make great use of this effect. Yeah, a really big threat that's just multiple removal spells on a stick seems pretty absurd. I'm pretty happy to take that. We could also take Calyx here and tie ourselves more into green-white enchantments to go with Archon of Sun's Grace. But as I said before, Archon of Sun's Grace is just a great rate, even if you're not casting uh, many enchantments. And the lifelink is going to be helpful in a black-white deck. I'm going to go for the Vona here over the Calyx. Well, that is not going to pan out super well for us, because Sithis Harvest's Hand is probably the number one card for green-white enchantments, so we're just going to scoop that up and probably head down that direction instead if we're seeing this pick five that means nobody in the first four picks of this pack wanted to hop onto the green white enchantments train so i guess we'll go ahead and do that ourselves definitely the strongest card in this pack a shy is really good too though um and there's almost no building you have to do to make a shy good just automatically good um yeah everything else is not quite on par with those two we'll go with the sithis here 
now we see Sanctum of Stone Fangs. Maybe we get to go green, white, black, Enchantress. Have a little bit of a shrine sub-theme. This is one of the strongest shrines because you're draining your opponent for life. So it's a win condition shrine and a, a shrine that can help stem the bleeding against more aggressive decks. So that could be interesting if we want to go for a shrine strategy. If we still want to just be like black, white, life gain, Indulging Patrician would be fine. But I think I'm going to take the shrine here. Maybe, maybe do a shrine deck today if we can. All right, pick seven now. Not a ton of great stuff in this pack. Bake into a, fi into a pie is pretty solid removal though. By this cube's standards, instant speed removal that gives you a food token to gain a bit of life. Sure, I guess I'll just go bake into a pie. Not a huge fan of any of the learn or lesson cards in the cube. They always feel, feel a bit below rate, below par. Could go Skyclave Relic for some mana fixing, but hopefully um, you can get some better mana fixing, such as dual lands like the Pathways. And I might take that here, although we could take Precipitous Drop because it is a removal and an enchantment at the same time, so it'll work really well with Sithis. But if we're going for a Sithis Enchantress deck, we're going to need a good amount of mana fixing, so I feel like... Environmental Sciences or Bright Climb Pathway are just going to be more important cards for us. I think I'd rather take the Pathway. So now we are at pack one, pick nine. This is the pack that we opened up here. We can take a Fang of Shigeki, a nice really cheap enchantment creature that kind of holds, holds your opponent's threats off because it's got Death Touch. Really cheap way to trigger Sithis. That seems pretty fine to me. Not really a Deadly Dispute deck, although that card is very good in the right deck. Now, I guess we just have Timeless Witness being a great value play, returning a card from your graveyard to your hand for four mana and leaving behind a 2-1 when you do that. Don't love Tranquil Thicket, especially not in a three-color deck where I'm probably going to take a lot of tapped uh, dual lands already, so I don't really want tapped mono-colored lands. Um, none of these really do much. I guess if we can consistently trigger Combi of Travel Secrets, that'll be solid, but it's still just like a limited power level card, not really a constructed power level. And in cube, we'd prefer to get the stronger cards like that. We don't need Horde Robber. I guess we can take Containment Breach. I do like Artifact and Enchantment Removal in this cube. It's just a lot of that kind of stuff going on. I don't really think any of these cards are all that good or synergize super well, so I guess we take the Enchantment theoretically that'll be the best snakeskin veil is going to be really important with a card like sithis lord of extinction looks really cool and really fun but it always ends up just being a big dork that can get chump block really easily so your opponent has all the time in the world to draw removal for it Ooh, wow okay yeah this is a really powerful pack and i'm pretty sure we're just going to slam down at gideon blackblade this card is just absurd it's not even a synergy card this is one of the cards that kind of irritates me in the tinkerer's cube i don't know why but this time around it feels like there's a lot of cards that are really strict on synergy that are like this card is just kind of garbage unless you're doing synergy kind of like um anointed procession obviously this doesn't do a single thing unless you're making a lot of tokens and then there's just cards like gideon that have nothing to do with any of the synergy cards and are just incredibly powerful so it's i don't know it's kind of annoying but um it's super powerful so we kind of just got to roll with it here and take it um, but the Wandering Emperor, I think, is the biggest groan test for me in this cube. In the for very similar reasons to the Gideon there. Ooh, now we can take Captain Sisse. This is a pretty powerful card in this cube. There's lots of legendaries. Tutor for Avona. We can tutor for a Gideon. We can tutor for a Sithis. We already have three cards to tutor for. That's more than enough. You only need a few. Because this is going to draw removal as quickly as possible. It's basically just tap to draw a card, and it's drawing a card that you know is a powerful one. Captain Sissé is just a sweet card. I really like Banishing Slash, too. Again, I love Naturalizes in this cube, destroy an artifact or enchantment, and this one can even destroy a creature if it's tapped. And sometimes you get a Samurai out of it, so that is a pretty sweet card, but it's going to be Captain Sissé for me first here. And now, nothing much enchantment-wise. There's a buffed Eliwick. I don't know what the buff is. So she ventures in the dungeon as a plus one, minus two, top six cards of your library, reveal a creature. She seems really kind of weird and specific and not great for our deck here. 
Yeah, I don't know what they changed for the alchemy version of her. Looks pretty much the same. This pack is weird. It's only pick three, and the only cards I really like here are like the aggressive red cards. I guess we can take a pest summoning in case we get a lot of learn spells. Another shrine here, Goshintai of Shared Purpose, to go with our Sanctum of Stone Fangs. Seems pretty good to me. It's also just an enchantment creature, which is nice for Sithis. Yep, pretty happy to take Goshintai of Shared Purpose. I forgot the name immediately. All right, so here, do love my main deck artifact enchantment removal like Knight of Autumn, but we've got a Gilded Goose, and Gilded Goose is phenomenal mana fixing. So I'm gonna roll with the Goose. Mask Vandal, another main deckable artifact enchantment hate card. We have Skull Prophet, which is mana ramp, but not mana fixing, because it requires the green and black mana to play it, and it only taps for green and black mana, so it already just taps for the kind of mana you already have. Or we have Environmental Sciences for more mana fixing. Environmental Sciences seems a bit below rate for a cube kind of format mana fixing, but we kind of take what we can get. I'll go Environmental Sciences. Maybe supposed to just take Mast Vandal there, but... We've got one dual land in our three color deck. I'm getting a little worried about the mana. Um, pretty much nothing great in here. I guess cleric class is fine in this deck. We've got a bit of life gain. Not a ton. It's not great. I don't think thieves tools is that good. I guess we're low on removal. Could grab you here something on watch, I guess. Naomi Pillar of Order. Do we have any artifacts whatsoever? Nope. So Naomi doesn't do anything. Unless we can pick up artifacts in the last pack. But at the same time, it's between that and Banalish Honor Guard, which is probably just a 2-mana 2-2. Two -two. Got a few legendaries, but not a ton. Maybe Light Containment con Construct here. We don't have any discard... Yet, yeah, no, maybe not. Anointed Procession, just in case we have enough token production. It's not looking super likely. We have the Archon and the Goshintai. That's two cards. Definitely not making the deck yet. Ovenwald Mystery seems okay. I think I just prefer an Aganjo here. Because Ulvenwald Mysteries will probably get cut. A Ganjo, since it's a land that just replaces a Plains in our deck, is not getting cut whatsoever. So it's just a guaranteed improvement to the deck, no matter what. Hi. I kind of like Jang Yangu here. And we get Masked Vandal, last pick. That's super sweet. But yeah, Jang, letting our creatures tap for mana of any color seems good. Got another shrine here, the Sanctum of Tranquil Light. Don't mind if I do. We'd love to wheel Godless Shrine or maybe even just like Epic Proportions just because it's a big enchantment. Um, Kodama would be fun as well, but definitely Sanctum of Tranquil Light. First pick out of that pack. Um, we have Tireless Provisioner, which is a great just value engine every time we landfall, but then we also just have the three weird sisters, which is just an incredibly strong card. A little hard to cast for our deck. It definitely looks like black is turning up, turning out to be the splash, but probably worth it. This card's just so sick. The bigger vampire Nighthawk draws us a card, lets us force each player to sack a, a creature. It's also legendary, which is great with Captain Sisse. She can tutor that up. Yeah, I'll take the uh, Henrika Domnathi there. Now we have Beanstalk Giant, which is mana fixing and a large endgame creature at the same time. We've got a bit of life gain for Witch the Moors, which is a powerful card. It's not a legendary, so we don't get to tutor it up. And again, black is our splash color a bit here. I think I'd prefer Beanstalk Giant. Again, I really want to get more mana fixing outlets here. Witch the Moors is a powerful card, but probably going to try to cut down on the black a bit and pick up some more mana fixing. Now we have 
Not a ton. Not a ton here. I guess just Thriving Heath, because this is a white, green, or white, black dual land. That seems best for us. We're not really a Pelt Collector deck. We're not aggroing anybody out. Not a Circle of Loyalty deck. I'm not going to try to just take over the game with a six-mana artifact. Yeah, I'll take the Thriving Heath here. More dual lands. Looks pretty good to me. Between that and Parallel Lives, we already have an Anointed Procession that I'm probably cutting. I don't think I'm going to double up on the very specific cards. Anointed Procession and Parallel Lives, they're the kind of cards that always look better than they are. Because yes, when you have the right cards to synergize them with them, they are really going to pop off. But more than most cards in the cube, they do literally nothing if you don't have the right card alongside them. Which is a really, really big drawback that isn't, um, isn't often accounted for in pick evaluation. Divine Visitation is very similar to those Anointed Procession type cards, but it's between that and like Hidden Stockpile here, so we'll we'll pick up that option. Is Fabled Passage better than Thriving Grove? We have a dual land that can be green-white or green-black, or we have a land that can be green-white or black. It is untapped later in the game, though. I feel like Thriving Grove is better, because it's... It's hitting any color we need, just like Fable Passages. And it's doing two colors at once. Wow, we get Godless Shrine here. Well, our mana base just got way better in this pack. I mean, to the point where now we have four duels. Maybe we just take Kodama this time. Damn, kind of cool to take Kodama. I think I like that better than Epic Proportions. Sure, that's an enchantment, but I think I want some more creatures in this deck, some more good on-curve creatures, and we're really getting paid off for that. We get Tireless Provisioner as well to fill that role. All right, this is looking really sweet. Tireless Provisioner is definitely awesome, this deck, and we wield Witch of the Moors, so we can play that too. This is going to be a wild deck. We have a Legendary theme, we have an Enchantment theme, we have a bit of Shrines. All of the shrines are legendary too, so Captain Sisse can search out all of our shrines. That's really cute. I didn't even think of that. Uh, I might splash in Archfiend. I feel like Archfiend's a little more exciting than Pelt Collector for me because a 5 mana 5 4 flyer can certainly close out some games. And even though it's double black, it has that built in cycling when we don't have the mana to cast it. Just cycle it and draw something else. Wow. This uh, this draft's kind of wild. I don't know if this deck is good. It's like a three-color multi-synergy pile here. But they seem like some good cards. We get to cut five cards out of this deck. Hmm. And cut some of our weakest just non-synergy cards, like the random removal that's not very good. I don't think Spinning Wheel Kick's super good in this deck either, because we don't have a lot of super high power creatures. It isn't a fight spell, though. Your creature just deals damage, so it's not under any risk. So even with just like four fours, I guess it's okay. But, I don't know. Roaring Earth definitely doesn't seem that good, but it theoretically it does synergize with Kodama, making sure all of our creatures are modified. We don't really need very many modified creatures for, for Kodama to be good. I don't think we need main deck environmental sciences anymore. It would still be alright, though. Two, three, four. We need to cut one more card, cut one of these random creatures like Chain Web Arachnir. We don't have any self mill. We don't have anything that synergizes with the Arachnia. We're kind of just running it as a decent rate. A one mana, one two reach that can escape from the grave later. Yeah, that's kind of the, that looks like our most random creature out of everything. Yep. I think I'm cool cutting these five cards, then making sure our mana base is good and, and calling it a deck here. It's got a pretty high curve here. So. Could go for 18 lands. We do have a flip land, though, the Ondu Inversion. The Ondu Sky Ruins. 
So we're theoretically an 18 land deck already. We just need to be willing to always play this Ondu inversion as a tapped land, unless we already have like five or six mana out. I think I can control myself. I think I can get myself to play this Ondu inversion as a tapped land. But uh, I have been known to get real greedy and avoid doing that because I'm like, no, I want to wrath this game. And then just die because I never make it to 8 mana. Yeah, I mean, I think this is the deck. This is a weird one. This is a wacky one. Really slow, too, on the curve. Not a ton of early game stuff. We still have a little bit, so we won't get caught with our pants down every game. But we certainly are going to have some struggles against some of the more aggressive decks in the cube. And we have seen some really powerful ones previously. We've lost to a lot of just like Boros good stuff aggro. With good planeswalkers like Gideon and Wandering Emperor. So I am very scared of those kind of matchups. Um, but uh, love to see our matchup against just other synergy-based decks. Looks like a pretty fun deck for sure. So without further ado, let's hop into the gameplay and see how well this deck will roll for us. All right, I realize I haven't double-checked the mana base yet. You definitely always want to do that in Limited. Make sure you build your own mana base. Don't let Arena do its things because it will fumble things and mess things up sometimes so we have 11 green symbols eight white symbols seven black symbols so we need green sources above all else and we have seven of those followed by white sources which we have one two three four five six seven of those and then followed by black sources which we have six of here four five six so i think i want to cut one planes for one forest minimum and that might be good enough for me that's eight green sources six white sources six black sources and thriving heath is a theoretical other green source thriving grove is a theoretical other white or black source Seems pretty good to me, eight green sources. We might want one more though, because green is very important. We have a few different green cards that can get us out of mana screw and pull out our other colors. Gilded Goose, giving us a man of any color. Tireless Provisioner, giving us treasure tokens. Zheng Yang Yu, giving us the ability to tap any creature for a man of any color. And Beanstalk Giant, searching for any basics. So I think I do want to up the forest count one more time here. Maybe cut one swamp here, because black is the least represented color of everything we have. That being said, all of our black cards are double black, which is a bit awkward. Um, but uh, it, it'll buff. I, I believe in our mana base. We got this. All right, here we are. Game one. Opponent is on the play. We've got all colors of our mana, but we do not have the double black for the three weird sisters, but that'll be okay because we just drew Sithis. If our opponent cannot kill the Sithis turn two, we are going to try our best to pop off. I could hold off on Sithis, try to cast her on turn three to make sure she's nice and safe and just play a Masked Vandal for now, ready to trade into Intrepid Adversary. I'm actually pretty cool with that. Masked Vandal's big enough to just get in here, stop this 3-1 lifelinker from jamming into us. So it might even draw removal from our opponent so that they can keep getting in, and it does, which leaves Sithis definitely looking more safe. So here's Sithis, and we're holding up Snakeskin Veil, so Sithis is definitely safe. I shouldn't say definitely, they could always have something that makes us sacrifice a creature if they have black in their deck as well, but they're already white, blue, and green. Alright, Stonehaven Pilgrim is the play. Sithis lives to see another day. Let's drop our... Could drop Captain Sisse. Which would be fine. We're still taking all the damage in the world. I think I'd rather gain a life, draw a card, and have a gain life engine on the board. A life gain engine. Ooh, and we drew Fang of Shigeki. Now I want to play my untapped land instead. But that means we can't play the three weird sisters next turn. I really want to hold up Snakeskin Veil still. Um, 
Yeah, we can go for a Captain Sisse. Let's do let's do untapped land Fang of Shigeki here. I should have went with Fang of Shigeki first, just in case I hit an untapped um, like green black duel. Uh, but I don't believe we have underground tomb or overgrown tomb or whatever it's called in our deck. No, we don't. So we were going to play that forest pretty much no matter what we drew. And we drew another Sanctum, which is beautiful. Well, there's a Sanctum of their own. They are still going to jam in here. Let's kill the 3-3 three, three lifelink. There's no way we get to get rid of their artifact and enchantment this game. So we'll kill the 3-3 three, three instead of the 3-1. Alright. Sanctum of Tranquil Light. See what we draw into. Gilded Goose, okay. Not bad. Next turn, our mana is going to be doing some great things. And we can even sacrifice this food token during their end step if we don't need to snakeskin veil. Hondan of Cleansing Fire. That's going to be really annoying. Our opponent's gaining four life a turn now off of just the Hondan. Not even counting the Intrepid Adversary. Um, Let's just let our goose die, I think. Just trade our goose into their adversary so we can get rid of all their creatures. Kind of okay with that. We've got four green sources, two black sources, and one white source right now, so we'll do pathway on white. And then... I'm gonna get a food out of the goose before we kill it. If they had removal to kill Sithis, they would have killed Sithis a long time ago, so the only reason to hold up Snake Skin Veil is to play around top deck removal, and we don't even have any more enchantments in our hand right now, so... I think we're pretty okay to just let Sithis die here. If they top deck removal. The Binding of the Titans. Each player mills three. They exile some cards from our grave, then they get a creature land back to their hand. Ooh, Gideon. Disgusting. Unfortunately, we already have we only have two white sources, so we can't play Gideon and Captain Sisse. I'm going to play Captain Sisse first. I want to just start um, dumping my hand onto the board. Just keep pulling out the strongest cards from our deck each turn. And this is a time where we can definitely spend the time dropping Captain Sisse because we're under, under like no pressure. All right, exiles a couple creatures from our grave. Rambunctious mutt. Irritating. Goodbye, Sanctum of Stone Fangs. Can't save that. All right, what are we doing, Captain Sisse? Vona, Goshintai, Zhang Yangu, or Akon Chu. Let's just get a Goshintai, I think. Another white source is a great draw, so we can drop Gideon as well this turn. Defend the weak at every opportunity. I believe in you, friend. Give the sisters vigilance. 
get in. Pass turn. I guess I don't get to hold up Snakes Can Veil if I get a couple 1-1s. One I think I'm okay with that. Even if they kill Captain Sisse, we've seen the remaining legendaries in our deck. There's just two of them, really. And one land. They kill Fiends of Darkest Night. We don't have a flyer anymore, but we still got a Gideon. Yeah, our threats are spread, off and spread out enough. One targeted removal spell doesn't hurt us that bad. Intrepid adversaries coming on down. It is going to get kicked once, so it gives plus and plus one to their board. We've got a pretty much endless supply of 1-1 spirits, so an easy chump block there. We've drawn another legend, so I think Captain Sisse only gets Vona now. Yeah, Captain Sisse only gets Vona. Well, that's still a thing. Vigilance, lifelink, or indestructible till end of turn. What do we want to do? Just vigilance on the flyer again, I think. Your light will cleave the darkness. I don't think I'm playing Zhang Yangu this turn. Oh, I guess I could because of Jang's ability. Letting my creatures tap for mana. It's nice to meet you. So we could have done that pre-combat for one more damage. Yeah, because I think I am just putting the counter on the flyer. That would keep giving vigilance. Pay for our 1-1s one again. Alright, they're just going to scoop them up. That is going to be 1 and 0. Oh. Here we are now, game 2. All three colors of mana available. Turn 4, Captain Sisse. We will keep this. And see where it goes. Lunark Veteran, turn 1 from our opponent's. Yeah, let's just get our early game blocker down. Make sure we don't just keep getting chipped in for damage in the early game. Our poor Masked Vandal's just going to get played as an early game blocker each game. Oh, they've got a Poet's Quill we could have gotten rid of with Masked Vandal later, potentially. Get that White Source down for Captain Sisse. And Devona. So their Poet's Quill allowed them to learn for Environmental Sciences, and that is what they're going to do this turn. Got a Fabled Passage on board as well. Just another white source from Environmental Sciences, they're on white-black. I think we're just wanting to get our treasure tokens for a while here, especially with Herald of Anguish in hand. Like to ramp into that as well as possible. I guess either technically ramp into Herald of Anguish, because Herald of Anguish can get um, improvised out. We do need one more black source, so being able to have one treasure at least is important here. I think I jam in here. Maybe even send in with Masked Vandal. But 
Then if they equip Poet Squill to Lunark Veteran, they've got a 2-2 Lifelinker coming in I can't block well. I doubt they do that, though. They probably want to commit to the board if possible. Or kill Captain Sisse if they have removal in hand. That is another great reason to get this treasure token, is it leaves our snakeskin veil up. So even if they have their 4 mana or less removal, we can protect Captain Sisse. Start popping off. Unfortunately, we already got our legendary land, uh, which I wasn't even thinking of that when I drafted this, but that is a sweet combo with Captain Sisse. The fact that that makes her versatile enough to even pull out a land when we need it. All right, there's a Charming Prince. That's super okay. They get to Scry 2 or gain 3 life or blink one of their creatures. They're going to Scry 2. Both to the bottom, they're not seeing what they want to see. Go to our turn here. We draw Sanctum of Tranquil Light, which means we could slam down Sanctum of Tranquil Light and the Black Sanctum as well off of Captain Sisse and start trying to grind out the game with Sanctums. We don't have the double white for Gideon unless we crack this treasure, which means we don't have it for Herald of Anguish anymore. I think I like just going double Sanctum here because we can do that and hold up a green without cracking the treasure. We do have the three weird sisters that would again require a treasure from us. Could grab Sithis. We have to pop a treasure to cast Sanctum and Sithis in the same turn, but Sithis is very good. Maybe it's Sithis here. I think it's Sithis. Sorry, treasure token. But this makes it possible to draw land off the top and just replace the treasure token and have more mana up next turn. If we get lucky, we do get lucky. Excellent draw. Fang of Shigeki, we'll keep that right on top. Slam that down for one next turn. Just play the Captain Sisse value game here. Captain Sisse plus Sithis. Huge value stuff for us. We're going to be able to just flood things onto the board while maintaining a pretty beefy hand. Witch of the Moors. That is pretty terrifying. We're going to want to kill that. Uh, but we do have a very expendable Masked Vandal right now. For now. Um, I guess we could just grab the white shrine and always have creatures to sack. And then we're really not worried about it at all. Yeah, I think I'm just in for that as the plan. Just grab the white shrine. Get two creatures per turn. We've still got Snakeskin Veil held up thanks to the treasure token. Heliod Sun Crown. It's pretty bad. Whenever they gain life, they're getting counters onto their stuff now. They're just gonna make Witch of the Moors just one really big threat. Alright, the lightning rod for removal has been assembled. I mean I guess we could triple block there. Just a 3-2 and a couple 1-1s. One 
Maybe I'm overvaluing my provisioner, but I don't really want to put it in harm's way right now. Probably am. Which of the Moors is a very important card. What do we have left, Captain Sisse? A lot. <laughs> We've got a lot of stuff left. Uh, let's start getting three one ones, maybe. Don't love the three weird sisters here. They just sacrifice Luminarch Veteran. Gideon's gonna take a little while to get to enough loyalty to exile something. Let's start jamming into Gideon. Yeah, I think I like Sanctum of Stone Fangs. Kodama is the draw. Fang of Shigeki holds off Witch of the Moors from attacking. Pretty fine with that. Oh, now we've got Ondu inversion at the ready. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. We've got the eight mana for it as well. But we have quite the board state, so unless something goes very wrong, we don't want to do that. But it's really nice to have the option, though. Uh, I've got the treasure tokens to cast Kodama and then pop a treasure for the one ones and then pop a treasure for Snakeskin Veil. Vale. But I really want to hold on to these treasures, being a greedy boy. I feel like we just have more working parts than our opponent does in terms of just accruing value every turn. Just maintaining uh, our position should be fine. Like, they do have some amount of synergies that are popping off to an extent, but I think our stuff is going to do more. Mall of the Sky Eclipse. All right, well, I mean, if they get to a point where they just have very few cards in hand, we can blow up all our stuff to undo inversion. Because if it's going to leave us in a position where they have two cards in hand and we have five, we're just going to win that game. And now we are taking a bunch of damage in the sky, so we probably just have to do that. Oh, I could have used Sync them. That would have required spending some treasure, though, so I wouldn't have Ondo Inversion next turn. I think if I realized that, I probably would have still just been going for uh, next turn Ondo Inversion here. All right, time for Ondu Inversion, I think. We could still try to just grind it out with Sanctum of Tranquil Light. Now that I am remembering that card, we could just keep tapping down their flyer. Let's see what Captain Sisse is going to get us here. Make one of our cards indestructible. Gideon is indestructible during our turn and gives another one of our cards indestructible. Maybe if we grab Gideon and set up the most disgusting onto inversion in the world next turn. So I need to hold up the mana to use the Sanctum. Which is how much? Three mana. Yeah, sure, we can definitely do that. I march into battle as your champion of justice. Will lend you my strength. I don't think I'm attacking with that, but just have that option. Okay. Yeah, we pass turn. Remember to tap down their flyer with our sanctum this time. Then we can have Captain Sisse pull out one of our last two legendaries. Then we can protect. I don't even know what we want to protect, like Sithis or something? This is them moving to combat, correct? I believe it is. I 
Alright, still going to send Heliod in. Plenty of 1-1s. One Marionette Master, okay. That's spooky. We only got the... They've got two artifacts. We're at 19. We'll gain three life, though. Got all these Heliod triggers. Oh no, all the Heliod triggers onto the Marionette Master? Oh lord. Well, that's awful. I don't think we can Wrath anymore. I need to do the math, but I'm starting to think we might not be able to Wrath. Six damage per artifact we kill. We're going to kill one, two, three, four, five. We're going to kill five artifacts. Five times six is 30. We need to be at 30 life to Wrath now. Gravy. Oh boy. Well. Wow, Marionette Masters ruins my day. Do we have enough mana to do anything with Herald of Anguish here? Not really. What do you get us, Captain Sisse? Jenge Goo and the Weird Sisters. So bad. I mean, if we just don't blow up. If we don't blow up the artifacts, we can still just go for the lock down game plan. Then we can have Gideon exile Marionette Master. So we're like good for a turn. We just tap down Witch of the Moors again, tap down whatever their flyer is. We need three mana up. We have all these treasure tokens. We could even just play Vona here. Sure. Now we've got a lifelinker on board too. Feels even more safe. Because now we can just hard cast onto inversion with our lands. I guess we're one man away from that. Wait, no, we can. We can. So we can spend all these treasures to tap down the flyer and hold up Snakes Can Veil still. These are going to be some long games. This is like game two. I'm almost an hour into the recording. Of course, it'll be a little less long in the video, probably 45 minutes or something at this point. Poet's Quill. Heading on to the Charming Prince so they can gain some life. Can chump block that all day. Environmental Sciences gains them a little bit of life. Which makes Marionette Master even bigger. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We might block their uh, servos with just one ones here. I'm 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 fully embracing. Oh, I missed my Sanctum of Tranquil Light trigger because I clicked one too many times after the counter. I got so used to just clicking because they have so many triggers on the stack.
God damn it. I think I lose because of that. Oh, I hate I hate digital magic sometimes. Vona still kills Marionette Master. Yeah, we'll be fine. Vona still kills Marionette Master. But like you saw last turn, I had to click like 50 times. So I've just gotten so used to just click, click, click every time Heliod goes on the stack. So Heliod went on the stick, I went click, click. Missed my trigger for Sanctum of Tranquil Light. Um, we are not killing these two twos. One, two, three, they are all blocked. Um, Charming Prince is blocked. Heliod is blocked. None of their artifacts die. Our Gideon dies, but Vona kills Marionette Master. Onto Inversion kills everything else. We have six cards in hand. They have zero. That is our plan. Well, they have one. We have six cards in hand. They have one. After an onto Inversion. My strength gave out this is a worse position than we would have been we would have been in a really really good position if we still had Gideon but now still a good position they're just going to have a Heliod out though still because Heliod is indestructible hopefully last card in their hand gets cast here sack a creature Uh, it doesn't really matter. They're all going to die next turn. All right. Get rid of Marionette Master. Andu Inversion will blow up all our treasure tokens, so we want to spend all our treasure on this and we want to get another right now. We want to use Captain Sisse before it pops off. We can even go Herald here. We have so many different options. But I am tired of their spooky board state. Alright, they get to draw one card here. Gain a bunch of life. Oh my god, please just resolve Heliod. Okay. Six mana. We can only cast one spell. Let's play our biggest threat. They need Devotion 5. Yes, they probably can't just immediately reassemble Heliod. That would be bad, because Heliod is really big. All right, Weatherlight doesn't do anything until they can crew it. And they need three power to crew it. There's a lone Sanctum of Stone Fangs, which does keep triggering Heliod. But it's not that bad. Herald of Anguish is going to make them discard their last card in hand, so whatever they're holding on to here is gone, so I'm very happy to play that. going to hold on to the snakeskin veils for our herald of anguish all right we get rid of portable hole out of their hand i think start putting counters on luminous phantom so it'll get big enough to crew weather light soon or they can just put a 12th power on the Heliod, I guess. Mm -hmm. 
Hello? Okay. Luminous Phantom it is. I'm gonna have something really weird in hand if they were thinking on that one. Nashi Moon Sage of Scion, okay. They're thinking about trying to get a ninjutsu hit in, I guess. And then they would remove a counter from the Phantom if they ninjutsu'd it back to hand. They wouldn't want to do that. Alright, well... Jengengu and Kodama are a fun combo, but we only have 12 cards left in our deck. So I don't want to pop off that much. Cooperation is the path to self-improvement. I will help you through this. I think I'm just going to sack Kodama to get rid of one of their creatures with the weird sisters here. Alright, so they just have the Weatherlight as a flyer. I don't want to let them draw off of the Weatherlight, and that would hit pretty hard, so I'm just going to attack with the one creature here. They are playing off the top. We've got a bunch of big flyers. All right, the crew weatherlight to draw off Bonner's Enclave. All right, fair enough. I can't imagine doing best two out of three in this cube when we have games like this. I'm gonna make it a five six with Heliod. Try to draw a card off of it. Thanks. All right, draw another card off Bonders Enclave. Their one flyer is gone now. They make their Death Toucher a 3 2 Death Touch now. Which of the Moors is the draw? That's really good when we flip the Weird Sisters. We're going to want to gain life off of them, so we are going to flip them right now to work with the Witch. I guess I should have dumped some mana into the buff there, because this happens in our end step. Yeah, so we can't cast whatever creature we pick up anyway. Ooh, Master Vandal. Don't mind if I do. Get Heliod out of my life. Barring Regimen, when they attack, get a counter on the creature. Okay, so they get to trade Nashi into our Archfiend. Because we are not letting the Witch die here. They learn for the Elemental Summoning.
Opponent still gaining a million life, but slowly but surely chipping that away, especially once we get the Masked Vandal down. Captain Sissy, we don't have any legendaries left in her deck. Just get that out of here. We're not going to need the man off Jen Gingu anymore, so we'll just get the extra damage. This even buffs the Witch because it buffs Death Touchers and Flyers. Oh, I don't have the mana to do it twice. All right, we are working on it. We're getting there. Probably just take the flyer. Gilded Goose is really good with Herald of Anguish as well because we make these food tokens that are artifacts that the Herald can then throw as minus two, minus two removal. There's all kinds of little weird synergies I'm noticing from playing the half hour long game. There's a Forsworn Paladin. It's gonna get blown up. Do we have lethal yet? Six, 11, 15, 16, plus 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. That sounds like lethal in my brain maths for some reason. Let's figure it out. Yeah, that's exact -sies. Did math it out. All right. Well, that was a wild game. I don't. I, I definitely misplayed a lot of that one. Really long one too. I even just misclicked. Um, past a combat that was somewhat crucial. We lost our Gideon for that. Um. Yeah, just our our. Early game synergies we got to pull off with Captain Sisse pulling things out so quickly, getting this Sith, the Sithis out quickly. We just still had so many options and so many things to do at all times there that we were always in a decent spot. But wow, it was a grindy one. That is going to be the end of round two as we head into game three. All right, we've got all three colors again, but we really need double black for this hand or double white, and we have neither of those. I feel like I got a mulligan this, because not only do we need to draw lands, we need to draw specific lands, and even if we do draw those, we're not doing anything until turn four, so that's going to be a mulligan for me. Sand is probably moderately worse. Uh, at least we can just cycle Archfiend, and we can definitely cast Masked Vandal. We can even cast it with a creature engrave, thanks to the cycling effect of the Archfiend. Uh, yeah, I think we get rid of the Witch. We need double black for the Witch, and we don't have any life gain in hand. So the witch isn't even likely to accomplish anything for a while. There's a life gainer, Vona. 1-3 does not do anything against a menace creature. So I'm just going to hold off for now. Probably cycle Archfiend, but keep Masked Vandal in hand until we either need a 1-3 blocker or we can actually blow up an artifact or enchantment with it. Quincy Harker. That's a 1-2. Taps for man of any color. Let's just cycle the Archfiend now. Tireless Provisioner. That is a nice pickup. We're just going to jam that out. Menace into one of the strongest ninjutsu triggers. Gives them a free Varus Silvery Moon Ranger. 
frickin' Nashy. We're gonna just get Vona down here. I think I do. Let's just get Vona down. Off the treasure token. Jugan defends the temple. Our opponent's deck is loaded. But now I've got something to blow up with Masked Vandal, which is nice. We can make sure no blocks they make go well for them, right? Because if we blow up the 3-3... Three, three, they have 3, 4, 5 power. I guess if they block Vona with literally everybody, they can kill Vona. Mm. I think that would be okay. Should probably start making food by now, but we might need a white source still. Alright, let's see. If they don't block with literally every single one of their creatures, we can pop off with Vona. They don't want to block with anybody. Okay. So we'll just gain some life then. Masked Vandal this temple. I kind of want to get rid of the ranger here. So they aren't doing any more venturing into the dungeon. Seven life to do that though. Puts the life totals at even. 13 to 13. Our board state's a little worse than theirs. I think I'm okay with that. Now our board states are pretty much even. They've got more cards in hand than us. We did take a mulligan this game though, I believe. So that's to be expected. Plus we've already played way more lands than them. So that could explain the disparity as well. If they have one more land in hand, then we tie the lands on board. And they have three cards in hand, we have two. Yeah, I think they're they're at advantage by a little bit here. But not a lot. Certainly got a shot this game. It all depends on what those cards in hand are, what the hidden information is. Going for it with Nashi. I mean, we're definitely going to trade for this with Provisioner. <sighs> Wouldn't have expected this attack. That's why I was pretty cool with tapping Vona. I didn't think that they would just jam into Provisioner. So it looks like a really easy trade for us, but I actually do value this Provisioner a lot. I might trade into Snakeskin Veil instead. I feel like if they had removal for Vona, they would have used it already. It's a pretty removal low cube. Removal light. Make the Vandal big enough to kill Nashi. If they want to dump a bunch of mana into the Paladin, they can make it so Nashi still kills Vandal, but it's just a trade. Nashi's going to die either way. We just lose our 1 3 now. Kappa Tech Wrecker is the play. Sithis is the draw. I think I'd rather just keep Sithis in hand than jam it out here. Because they have a Kappa Tech Wrecker. We can't really even attack with Vona into that, can we? We have to just shoot it with Vona's ability and pass the turn, but that puts us to so low on life. Um, you know what we do? We actually full control here and we do the fancy Vona play. Which is where we attack with Vona. Before Declare Blocks, we kill the Death Toucher. This guarantees we still gain our 4 life and kill the Death Toucher. 
that's what we do. Because we're mega dead. If we just shoot the death toucher, don't gain the life. And now we can cast Sithis. Because they don't have their enchantment removal. And we get a food this time. And it turns out we did need that treasure we made last time. But we would have ended with the same board state had we made a food last turn. We would just make the treasure this turn instead of the food this turn. But yeah, we did need the next white source. All right, even life totals. I think our board state is a little better, but they have cards in hand. We've got nothing. Game is looking close. Find a curse that'll just blow up our enchantment. Okay. Naturalize coming in hot. Our opponent agrees with my opinion of naturalizes in the cube and that they are good. Cap attack wrecker and you find a cursed idol. Evolution Sage. They get to proliferate, but they have nothing to proliferate onto right now. So for now, it's just a 3-2. Oh, I just realized Provisioner is actually really good with the Butcher of Magan because the Butcher needs us to have the excess life to keep blowing things up. Ooh, Goshen type shared purpose. Oh, I wish I had a treasure now. We attack with Vona, and then depending on how they block, we blow things up because they don't have the mana to buff anything. If they don't block, we probably just don't even need to blow anything up. And if they do block, we can blow things up in response to a double block. They just don't have a good block here. Oh, snap. That's smart. Quincy Harker getting the buff if we put another card in their grave. If they have four more creature cards in the graveyard, Quincy Harker gets a buff. That is really smart. I didn't even realize that. Which means... We have to blow up Quincy Harker to just kill all their creatures. They're down to a 1-1, we're down to a 3-2, and we're in a top deck war now. I think that's what that means. Yep, that's what we do. I think the attack is still good. I mean, it's a three for one here. But I did not notice that until now. So, top deck war, here we go. One card in hand to one card in hand, drawn off the top. Haunted of Knight's Reach, is that? That's upkeep, right? Oh, thank God. That triggers at the upkeep. But we don't have the white source for Goshintai, but we do have the treasure token, actually. So thank goodness we drew a land to make a treasure token here, otherwise that would have hit us pretty hard. Shen Yangu doesn't actually do much for us. We'll scry that to the bottom. The shrine fight is on. Hit them down to five, get a one one. Just a land from them. Hondu Inversion is our draw, 4, 5, 6, 7. If I just hold on to this, Honda's going to make us discard it, so we have to play it here. in the fang bear but we go wide around that and find lethal here this should be game should be 3-0 and to start off this draft I guess I should have played this land first in case they do have a trick in hand 
and they survive because then we would be missing out on a, another food token. But it looks like no trick in hand. That will be 3-0 and to start off. That was a really scary game. I was a little sketched out after the mulligan, and then our opponent had a pretty pretty solid start there. They had the Nashi getting them that free Varus, some stuff like that. But Vona did a lot of work for us, even in that combat where I didn't realize they could kill Vona. It's like, yeah, they could kill Vona, but we can still get the three for one off of it after it's already done so much work previously. So Vona, Butcher of Magan, and Tireless Provisioner, those two cards really doing a ton of work in that matchup. Really nice stuff from them. So let's head into game four. All right, game four, really excellent mana drawn here, but the hand's pretty slow. We still have a two drop though, at least. As soon as we get four mana, we get to go Shintai. I am gonna keep this. We are on the play two, which can help with slower hands. We'll be the first one playing spells no matter what. Um, we've got two double black cards, so I'm going to play Thriving Grove as a green black source, and we might even end up playing this pathway on black later. Definitely just play our forest next turn, though. Wait on the pathway till turn four. If we don't draw white source by turn four for Goshintai, we will have to pathway on white. I am an enjoyer of greed, so I'm just going to chill with my Masked Vandal. I don't really feel like hitting for one every turn is going to matter too much, but blocking a 3-1 lifelinker will, so uh, now we'll jam out a Masked Vandal. It is looking like we're going to have to play our pathway on white for our Goshintai. Poet's Quill, oh no. Poet's Quill is going to make the Intrepid Adversary a 4-2. And they have the Portable Hole. Wow, our opponent is a very mana efficient aggro deck here. This is going to be a rough start for us with a slow hand like this. And we've drawn a double white card that we can't cast. Wow, we're going to get max punish for this hand. We can't cast our double white or double black cards. Unless I just take a turn off here playing this pathway on black so I know I can Witch of the Moors and then Herald of Anguish later, but Herald of Anguish is a 7 drop, which the Moors doesn't do anything by itself. I don't think I can afford to do that. So now we have a hand full of cards that are uncastable right now. Definitely not looking like our game. Aggressive start from our opponent with a slow hand like this, and we're going to get punished for the mana in it to where might all be uncastable. A Healy Hut as well to go with the adversary. Well, I'm taking this trade while I can. Because if I don't take the trade right now, it's a 4-2 from Heliod or it's a 4-2 from Poet's Quill. This is the only way I can get creatures off of me. So unfortunately, I don't get to keep the Goshintai, but I get to get rid of that lifelinker that I definitely couldn't have got rid of any other time. Callous Blood Mage. A 2-1 that enters the battlefield and draws them a card. Slap a Poet Squill onto it, or cast Argul's Blood Fast. Our opponent's going to draw a million cards. Thriving Heath is a beautiful draw. That means everything in our hand will be castable now, because we'll have double white and double black. But we do still have to wait a turn. And our opponent has assembled quite the board state here. Heliod and Poet's Quill to consistently gain life with Argyle's Bloodfast to draw cards off of that extra life. This game isn't ending how I thought it would, where I thought our opponent was just going to aggro us out of the game real quick and we'd just be dead by now, but um, they still managed to just set up some great synergies while we can't do anything. So it's ending in a functionally very similar way, but instead of killing us immediately, they're just establishing uh, way too much value. Like we're still taking good amounts of damage, but our opponent is also gaining so much life that this Argyle's Blood Fast is going to be an easy, just draw as many cards as they want. Restoration of Aegonjo is enough devotion for Heliod that Heliod gets to send in. What tricks do they have? Nothing on board, just tricks in hand. If they've got a trick in hand to kill Harold, so be it.
precipitous drop. All right, you got it. I mean, I'll fight it out here, but our opponent basically won this game several turns ago. Um, I don't think it matters which source we pull out here. But I'm still in it because I can bake into a Pied Daxos in response to their attack. Which makes it so Heliod's no longer a creature. I don't think that's true anymore since they got another white symbol. They have devotion of one, two, three, four. It is still true. If we kill Daxos, Heliod isn't a creature anymore. Alright, I mean, it's not completely over. Now we can kill the adversary by sacrificing this food token. I'm surprised we're still in it right now, but we're sort of still in it. Barely, but kind of. Oh, I probably should have, I probably should have taken the enchantment creature because we have Archon of Sun's Grace. Oh dear. That's a 5-5 five, five flying lifelink double strike. Oh dear indeed. We're going to have to chump block in the sky here. You're gonna draw me something important. That's the question. Sithis. Sort of? Could make each player sack a creature with the weird sisters, then we trade the witch into the architect, I guess, because we, we need a flyer to trump here. I don't think that's the play. Life of Chishiro Umazawa. Gain even more life by buffing the enforcer. Oh, they chose to just gain two off the life of Chishiro. Path. Got a Gideon as well. Shame yeah, I don't I don't see how we possibly win this game. We can fight this out. Which we have, which is surprising. But uh oh, I guess we can't, because now we have to we have to block everything here. We lose all of our creatures. Never mind. Um but I was gonna say like even if we keep surviving. We have to basically beat our opponent's whole deck to win because of this blood fast with their amount of life gain. We can't kill any of these. They're all indestructible. And we can't have any creatures survive this combat because they're all too small. I guess we could let Architect of Restoration in to keep one creature of our own on the board so we can keep our Archon, I guess, so that we can get more chump blockers off Sithis. It's our best bet, maybe? Best bet at just living another turn just to say we could.
Um, no enchantments for Sithis here. Unfortunately, but Sithis does give us a blocker from Archon and a blocker from just being Sithis. We can be all kinds of rude, make them discard the last card in their hand. We'll be at um, six life if we attack here. They probably just kill us on the crackback, but I want to do something, so I'm just going to slap Gideon and be mean. Take that, Gideon. Oh yeah, I'm pretty sure we die here. Fingers crossed. End my suffering. Prepare for battle. You know, I guess we have an Ondo inversion in our deck. I think we're deaders here. We gained two life off this block. We're not dead. We're going to be at two life. All right. Well, if I top deck Ondo inversion, <laughs> that's my one, my one out. That is not on to inversion. That is game. All right. Even then, that'd be a position where we're on to inversioning on the defensive. So we draw on to inversion and cast it. We have one card left in our hand. Our opponent has four from their blood fast. And they keep uh, Heliod because Heliod's indestructible. I guess we'd get back our masked vandal so they wouldn't keep Heliod. Portable Hole would die, which gives us back Masked Vandal, which lets us kill Heliod. So that's kind of cute. But yeah, four cards in hand to one. Don't think we win even with the um, Ondo Inversion. But that was, a, that was a good reason to play it out that I forgot. Maybe an earlier Ondo Inversion could have got us there. But that was a game. I said it when it was happening, but... Definitely easy to forget that by now because of how long the game was and how ridiculous the board state was at the end. But that was just a game where we get punished for the slow hand for sure. The slow hand allowing our opponent, our opponent to just get their lifelink down and start jamming in. And then there were multiple crucial turns in the middle there where we had to just wait because we had double black and double white cards in hand so while our opponent gets to set up throughout those turns we're actively putting nothing on the board so that'll always be a really big hindrance on the game so three and one as we head into round five punished by the mana base there that'll happen with three color decks speaking of three color decks look at this mana base this is pretty spicy i'm gonna keep this i like uh grove on green white then Temple of Silence, we've got double white already. We've got our green up. Bright Climb Pathway could go on black, and then we have double white and uh, double black. Then the only thing we don't have would be double green for Timeless Witness, but like to cast Archon of Sun's Grace first regardless. I think it's worth holding on to Sanctum of Stonefangs to potentially get a Pegasus out of with the Archon, so I'm not going to play Sanctum this turn. I'm going to play Temple of Silence. Might be a bit greedy. I like Snakeskin Veil for the Archon. But would I rather just draw more threats? Because I am going to be just playing Archon on turn 4 with shields down regardless. I've got a Vona in hand too, though. We have really good cards to protect, so I'm going to keep Snakeskin Veil. You can Beanstalk Giant turn 3 here, actually. Yeah, no, that's true. We can Beanstalk Giant turn 3. That'll make it so turn 4 we have Archon, and we get to hold up the green mana for the Snakeskin Veil to protect it. 
We're playing against white, black, and blue here. They've got the hidden stockpile and the restoration of a Gonjo. Go ahead and beanstalk giant for a forest, because we have double black, we have double white, we don't have double green. And that's important for Timeless Witness. So, Restoration of a Gonjo popping off. It's going to ramp them up just like our Beanstalk Giant did. Pull a planes out of their graveyard. And then it's going to turn into a 3-4 Vigilance that creates 1-1s one every time it attacks and blocks. Okay, so I want to play an untapped source here. So we're going to play the pathway. We have double white. We have double black. We have double green. Let's get another white source, I guess. We've got a lot of white cards in hand. And then we're going to slam down Archon of Sun's Grace, holding up green for Snakeskin Veil. Hopefully, hopefully not a counterspell from our opponent. Hopefully just targeted removal if they're wanting to kill our cards. It looks like neither for now. The restoration of a Gonjo has become the Architect of Restoration. There's the Touch the Spirit Realm to kill the Archon. No. So now we have a 4-5 or five Archon that cannot be targeted this turn. So we even gain extra life off of it, which is really cool. Ooh, and we, do, we drew the uh, Fang of Shigeki to get even more out of this card. So we already have 5 mana, which is enough for anything, everything in our hand, but we can't get Beanstalk Giant down. So we probably do play onto Sky Ruins, even though we won't have a Wrath anymore by doing that. I think it's probably worth it to get closer to the Beanstalk Giant. Let's slam out our enchantments while we've got the Archon. Because they are going to blow up the Archon next turn if they can. Divine Visitation. Whenever they make a token, they make a 4-4 flyer instead. So we are killing the heck out of the Architect of Restoration. And we gotta find a way to get through a 4-4 flyer. I think I'd rather lose one 2-2 flying lifelinker than a 1-1 death toucher right now. Weirdly enough. Just because these aren't gonna chip in when that 4-4 is out anyway. Oh wow, when they revolt, they get the 4-4 four, four flyers too? Well, Witch the Moors is a great draw. Um, this is a problem and a half. Wow. Because now even if I Witch the Moors, I like attack with Arcan of Sun's Grace, they can double block. We just kill one of the flyers. Our Archon's gone. Yeah, Divine Visitation with Hidden Stockpile is an issue. Good god, do we just play Vona so we can blow up Divine Visitation eventually? For now, just hold back on blocks. I suppose that's kind of where we're at, I think. Fang of Shigeki might be an okay attack. Sure, we just trade for the Servo, but if it goes to their turn, they can sack the Servo to Scry 1 and turn the Servo into a 4 force. So it's kind of like the Fang trading up into a... 4-4 four, four flyer. So that might be worth an attack, the Fang. I don't know. I'm not going to do it. But it's it's questionable. Yeah, so 100%. Sack the Servo to get a 4-4 four, four flyer. In their end step. And then go to the end step. Go Shintai of Shared Purpose. Oh my god, I forgot. Witch of the Moors is just going to trigger no matter what, because our Sanctum. See, so yeah, Witch of the Moors is really good here. So we play Witch of the Moors this turn. Now that we have Vona down. And we want to just use Vona to get rid of Divine Visitation. Alright, cool. So that's gone. Now we just play Witch of the Moors and start chipping away at the Flyers. Fingers crossed, no counter. No spell swindle. Pass turn. 
Oh, I should have attacked with Fang this time. It's not like Fang's blocking these flyers. And which of the Moors lets us bring Fang back from our grave. That was a huge missed opportunity there. Definitely should have attacked with the Fang. I guess it's not a huge missed opportunity. We just missed out on one point of damage. There's no way our opponent blocks. So we missed out on one single point of damage. That's not as bad as uh, I was making it sound like. It's not like we get to force our opponent to block our Fang of Shigeki. Alright, we're just going to keep accruing which of the Moors value, I think. They're just going to scoop them up. They are over it. Sang of the Stone Fangs is going to slowly kill them here, while which of the Moors keeps their creatures from being too big to attack into us. Vona keeps shredding their board state. Yep, opponent is over it. Four and one it is. A nice positive record for this draft, whatever happens from this point on. Pretty nice one. We haven't gotten a four win run yet. We've done two, three, 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 and five, three. And now we've gotten four wins. So even if I lose the next two, hey, that's my first four, three. That's something neat. So this is a bit of a risky one. But I am planning on riding this Kodama the West tree all the way to victory. We get to play this on turn three and on turn four, give it a plus one plus one counter with Jang Yangu, meaning it'll be modified. So we get to start pulling out the basic lands we need when it hits our opponent. So this hand crumbles to a removal spell on Kodama right now. So fingers heavily crossed. If they don't have that, this hand is very good. They do not have that, so now we Jang Yangu, get a counter on Kodama, get ready to pull out a Plains here, I think. Actually, probably pull out a Swamp, because the Swamp would immediately lead to casting Archfiend of Ifnir next turn and having double black for Herald. We need two Plains to get to Archon. Hey, you look like a worthy opponent. Teamwork is strength. I guess because uh, if, if Jang Yangu stays on board, Kodama can tap for a man of any color. We could cast Archon next turn if Zheng Yangu is still out, but I'm assuming Zheng Yangu is going to get killed here. So would we rather cast Archfiend of Ifnir or Vona, Butcher of Megan? I think Archfiend of Ifnir. I think I want to get into the sky here. They got a 1, 2, a 3, 4. I don't think Vona is going to be that super great attacking it on the ground because they're probably just playing more ground troops here. But Vona's activated ability is really, really good, as we've seen. We've only got one planes in the deck. Let's pull out the planes. Let's pull out the planes. Don't get to cast the Archfiend or the Herald, but now we're closer to Archon and we're definitely casting Vona. There's Feed the Swarm on Kadama. A little too late, though. We've got the mana out of it. And old Rutstein from our opponent. Now they snipe Zheng Yangu. Alright, so here's Vona. We can cycle this Archfiend. It's another reason that we don't like need need the double black immediately. Because we can cycle Archfiend at least. Three cards left in their hand. Do they have another removal spell for Vona? That is where we will definitely start to have a bad time, because if we don't draw the right mana here, nothing else in our hand, so we need our Vona as our one threat for now. Excuse me. The hiccups. This is super suspicious, but if it's anything that was going to kill Vona on an attack, it would kill it on a block too. I guess unless it's sorcery speed minus X minus X. Oh, destroy a creature that's been dealt damage this turn. It's covert cut purse. We don't block. I don't know why that's in this cube, but it is in this cube. I remember that. Three mana, two, one. When it enters the battlefield, destroy a creature that's been dealt damage this turn. They can recast it from the grave as the five mana, two, two death toucher. That is probably what's in their hand here. Can we still be friends? No. Alright. Harvester of Souls. Gets drawn off of Eliwick. 
That is not good at all for us. That's a big old 5-5 Death Toucher. I guess we can blow it up with Vona pretty easily. Uh, we definitely cycle Archfiend. Hope for a better land. My fingers are so crossed they're in pain. All right, so Vona, we just kind of slam in, gain a bunch of life. Kill Eliwick here, I guess? Or do we just hit them? They only gain life if they pull out legendary creatures with Eliwick. We just slam into them here. I don't know, I'm still gonna... I'm gonna poke at Eliwick. We're probably just killing a Taxidermist, I guess. Nope. Just gonna let it happen. I'm gonna hold on to Snakeskin Veil. Now I can do the block, even if they have Cut Purse, but they're probably not gonna go for the attack this time is the problem, because they want to use all their mana on Harvester of Souls instead. Maybe they'll still go for the attack, because the thing about playing Harvester of Souls is they know that I can just tap Vona and kind of nullify that whole turn. They do 7 to us, though, when they do that. Oh god, Vivian? Target creature deals damage equal to its power to a creature you don't control. They get 2 plus and plus one counters on a creature. Good gravy, okay. Yeah, Vivian's... Big. Big Vivian. Seven loyalty, too. It's a plus two ability. It's me, Planeswalker deck. Planeswalkers are wild. Uh, okay. Well. This is another game our mana base is going to catch up to us. Even if we pulled out double black here... We wouldn't have been able to cast Vona, we would have just cast a single 5-4 flyer this game. And then I guess a Herald of Anguish could cast by now. Yeah, we'd have a better shot had we drawn the second black source, but I think we still lose from the mana draws. The joys of playing 3 color and limited. This is why I'm so much of a coward about three color decks. I guess they could just escape. Yeah, no, we super lose. We mega lose, because even if we kill Fairy spawn, so they can't block well, they could just recast it from the grave and kill Vona. And if we sit here doing nothing, they can just shoot Vivian. We snake skin veil to stop that, but Way bigger board state. That was a misplay, though. I should have just sat here. Just always feels bad to do that. So now they escape Farrakhan's spawn. All right. Big misplay there, but not one that's going to matter. Just demolished by the mana again. Four and two as we head into round seven. All right, round seven. We got the Gilded Goose right off the bat. Big fan of that. Temple of Silence as well. I love the sound this goose makes. It's so good. <laughs> it's so good. I just need more gilded geese in my life. What do we got? Temple of Silence. A forest. Um, be your fourth mana. We really want more black or white sources, though. I'm gonna dump it. You know what? I, I accomplished things today. This is a real long draft, no matter what happens here. And we got to kill somebody with a Gilded Goose. We hit for exact lethal with Henrika Domnathi's ability, buffing all of our flyers, including the Goose one game, so... We had some fun here. Just play Gideon and just smash. I think I'd rather set up for one of my five drop cards, though. Might be greedy. But that's what I'm going to do. 
I don't want to play a Ghost Shintai without the mana to even make the spirit out of it anyway. And again, if I use Gideon here, then I don't have the food for Goose anymore. So it just makes all these other cards way harder to cast. Silver Smoked Ghoul. 3-1 that comes back from their grave if they've gained three or more life in a turn, which they have by sacrificing it. Because they gain two off of the life, and then another one off of Lampet of Death's Vigil. Bacon to a pie is the draw. That is not a land. Um, what now? I mean, we could cast our Goshen tie and just not make a 1-1 one -one still. But at least this time we leave behind another food token to use as another treasure next turn. It's either that or playing a Gideon that's going to get slammed for four. Or... Cycling an Archfiend, I guess? I feel like out of those options... Just do the best of some bad options. Just cast Go Shintai. Banishing Slash, gonna blow up the Goshintai. I actually would have been in a world of hurt if they used that on the Goose. I have no shot here. Still don't have a great shot, but like a 0% shot. Alright, so we've got 5 mana now. We can drop our Witch without much life gain, but it's still a 4-4 death toucher. We could just play a 5-4 in the sky. They're both the same amount of toughness, so I think I'll put out the one with the better ability, because the most important thing either of them is going to do is block. And they're both equally good at blocking. So I'll put out the one that's just as good at blocking and could potentially pop off some other stuff. Like maybe we could just make a food and sack it with the goose next turn. That makes them sacrifice a creature. We pull one back from our grave. Liliana's Reaver from our opponent. We've got a Ganjo now. That'll be our fifth man. It'll be our second white for Gideon. So we can play Gideon and then make a food off of the goose. Gideon's not really going to let us attack with anybody, though. Because we can't afford to tap our Witch of the Moors. I kind of want to just cycle Archfiend. Because I have the mana to do that and play Gideon. Worst case scenario. Thriving Heath. Are we playing Gideon here? Or are we just getting a food? I feel like I'm just getting a food. I really want to set up to cast this bacon into a pie. We can do that by getting a tap to land out this turn. So we have double white and double black naturally, plus a food from Gilded Goose for the, the unnatural doubling up. Unfortunately, though, Liliana's Reaver has a good enough ability. We probably just have to trade Witch of the Moors into that rather than holding on to the Witch. Because that's going to be huge. If they make us discard a card and get a 2-2. Hooded Blightfang. All right, Death Touch Tribal popping off. So they drain us for life when the Reaver attacks as well. I guess we can chump block with the goose. That feels like it's probably not the right thing to do, though.
But that lets us keep the witch. The witch lets us start chipping away at their board. I feel like I want to keep this witch badly. And I really don't want to discard a card and give them a 2-2 at the same time. Draw a card off Circuit Mender, drain us for one. Drain with Silver Smoke Ghoul because they get it back from the grave. Okay. Six mana here. We could cast Herald of Anguish because we have an artifact to tap for it, but I think we're baking into a pie. I think we're baking the Reaver into a pie, and we're probably gaining some life here to force another sacrifice out of our opponent. So bake into a pie, crack a food is the play. Hold a Gonjo in hand to be able to use his removal in the future. Or we could just crack the food and then use a Gonjo on Liliana's Reaver, but that allows them to drain us for life off of attacking with Reaver, which gets them closer to another return of Silver Smoke Ghoul, which could be important because that's probably what they want to sack to the Witch's ability. See, I think we bake into a pie... And crack a food right now. Kind of want to get Goshintai, but it's a lot of mana. Gilded Goose is going to be the easiest one to get right back on the board. Goshintai is going to be the best blocker. The Goose does keep us fueled with the food to keep Witch the Moors going, and it's cheap. This is weird, but I'm gonna I'm gonna I am gonna hit goose, I think. Super weird. Alright, so they did sack Silver Smoke Ghoul and top deck removal probably does it. Can't go for it with Witch of the Moors anymore. We still have a Ganjo. We still got Herald of Anguish to drop down. We can block everything but the Death Toucher. It's a Death Touch Menace now, too, so we can kill that with a Ganjo in the future. For now, we play Herald, and then we want Gideon to give the Herald lifelink. So if they can't kill the Herald, this is going to be big. We get to play the Goose and the Herald, because Goose gives us another food to tap for the Herald. Yeah, if they can't immediately kill Herald of Anguish... I mean, they're discarding a card from our hand. Herald of Anguish turns these food tokens into removal spells. The Gilded Goose keeps making the food. The Goose-Herald combo back at it again. Still a big shot here. Especially because if Herald survives, Gideon gives it lifelink. One card in hand. Priest of Ancient Lore draws them a card but doesn't kill the Herald. Unless they draw three or less removal for it. All right, Ancestors Embrace to give Hooded Blightfang lifelink. So that'll be three life gain this turn to get the ghoul back on board. They are still synergizing for sure. All right, here we go. Herald of Anguish, time to pop off. But we cast Gideon, don't we? Cast Gideon, get life gaining. I think we do. And then hold on to a Ganjo. Use a Ganjo to kill the Blight Fing. We get Vigilance here instead of Life Link. They only drain us for... Well, Lampad is scary. Lampad is scary. Let's get lifelink. This turn, at least. But maybe Vigilance in the future. Your light will cleave the darkness. Make them discard their last card in hand here. At the end step. We have a Gonjo held up thanks to the Goose. They could attack all at Gideon instead of us. 
We won't have lifelink anymore, but we'll still have Herald of Anguish with these food tokens to remove their creatures. They send Silver Smoke Ghoul at Gideon, Priest of Ancient Lore at Gideon. Ooh, if this is how they're attacking, we can really pop off with Herald of Anguish plus a Gonjo. Um, we can minus two, minus two the Silver Smoke Ghoul with Herald and still have the three mana up to a Gondra, the Hooded Blight Fang. Which we really want to kill. Okay, if they send in like this, we can't kill enough to save Gideon unless we throw multiple removal spells that way. All right, they're thinking it through what they want to do here. There's just everybody at Gideon. Okay, everybody at Gideon. I think Gideon just dies then. Because I can kill two of these. No, I can save Gideon still. But I have to let them keep the Blight Fang to do it. That's probably worth it. They can sack the ghoul to draw a card here, though. This is a 1 for Lifeling Death Touch Menace. Feels so good to kill that. But no, let's protect our boy. Protect Gideon. He's our homie. Yeah, if we can just keep gaining 5 life a turn, then... I guess a 1-4 Death Touch Menace thing doesn't matter. Oh my god, it kills- Oh my god! The flavor text! I had to kill that no matter what. Ooh, onto Inversion, is that castable? 4, 5, 6, 7? It will be soon. Off of the Gilded Goose food next turn. Well. I can't believe I forgot that a Death Touch kills. So Gideon was going to die no matter what there, so we should have just killed the best creatures to kill. Alright, whatever, we're on Ondu Inversion now. That's our, our plan. Do we attack with Herald here? No, I'll probably play it safe. Just pass. That's rough. I, I really should have just shot the the hooded blight fang. Less easy for them to life gain synergy into crazy stuff. Please dump your hand, opponent. That's not dumping your hand. Are we really on onto inversion? I'll need foo to <laughs> foo. <laughs> I only need two food tokens to kill the hooded blight thing. This game is hard. Magic's a difficult game. The fact that they still have two cards in hand, that's the issue. Yeah, I guess we have to inversion. Because this is just gonna keep getting bigger. Silver Smoke Ghoul comes back. We'll get our food. Memory of Tashira, weirdly enough. Oh, that's not the card. Oh, it's Automated Artificer. There was one of those cards in Kamigawa that's weird because it can spend mana on like only artifacts or abilities. 
And the abilities that it can spend it on are literally any abilities. doesn't have to be artifact abilities. Well, it looks like we didn't need that food token because we draw the eighth land for Ondu Inversion regardless. I don't want to do it. I don't want to do it, but I'm pretty sure I'm supposed to. Yeah, this hooded blight fan cleric class sh chicanery cannot stand, cannot remain. Dang. Yeah, I played this one poorly. I can't believe I forgot this text. If I had remembered this text and known that Gideon was going to die no matter what, I could have shot down better creatures during that combat and just taken over the game the regular way and not had to cast this onto inversion i'm fairly certain but we're just stuck in this position now where i have to cast it because i didn't realize all that well, that's a really excellent start to the top deck war but that could have been in their hand before Ooh, archon of sun's grace we're not doing that bad for ourselves either would really like to hit an enchantment off the top but not a bad board state. Oof. Legion's landing to follow up Heliod. That's a lifelinker. Luminous Phantom gains them life when things hit the board. Or when things leave their graveyard. Leave the battlefield. I always forget. This one's a really weird one. Land off the top. Not cool. Very not cool. Um, do we attack with Archon? Yeah, we have Kodama. We attack with Archon here. Opponent is playing off the top. We'll see what they drew this turn. But actually, right now, just a couple 1-1s. One There's a Charming Prince. That's super bad. They gain life. Get a counter on one of them. I guess that's not that bad. Because they're still not big enough. But they get the Silver Smoked Ghoul back, which is bad. That is very bad. Get our Provisioner. Can they get two counters on at instant speed here? Or more counters on at instant speed? No, they can't get enough. I was like, wait, did I completely not see some way they can get this Luminous Phantom to 4-4 four, four status? Wow, these are some very good draws from our opponent. Blood Artist hitting the board now. She is phenomenal with Heliod and Silver Smoke Ghoul and all that kind of stuff. Makes all these just 1-1s one and blockers and stuff really important. Send that in to get a counter off here. They have no instant speed abilities right now. Their only instant speed ability is Heliod, which just gives lifelink that already has lifelink. Plus they have an instant speed way to gain a life here. And this is just to trigger Blood Artist and make their other stuff bigger. But yeah, even then it does make Luminous Phantom a 4-4. And brings that Silver Smoke Ghoul back. This is pretty insane. I don't think we can just keep up with the synergy our opponent has. Draw a card here, though. Masked Vandal? Alright. I 
And without... If they didn't have Heliod earlier, all their stuff would still be tiny. Or still get draining, getting drained for a lot of life. The fact that Heliod has stayed as long as it has means I don't think Mass Vandal matters too much now. Because they already have a big enough blocker for Luminous Phantom. So they can just sit behind it and drain us out. But it's still a good draw. Oh my god, Cosmos Elixir 2 to draw a card every end step for them. That is very good. Ooh, Timeless Witness. Oh my god, that's a good card. Draw a 5 mana or less card. Any 5 mana or less card and immediately cast it. We could get Witch of the Moors. Go Shintai, Archfiend. I think we pick up Witch of the Moors with this. Cast it post-combat. Just send the three weird sisters in to trade with their flyer. Because of the death touch. Or we just gain some life here. Either way, we need to gain life to trigger Timeless Witness. Alright, cool. Get their flyer out of the way. Get the Witch of the Moors. Kill the Charming Prince now, I believe. We could pick up the three weird sisters again, but which of the Moors is huge with these life linkers. Um, oh yeah, I guess we can just pick it up now if we really want to. Um, Goshintai is really good too, though. These are all incredible options off the witch. We don't have anything to make a lot of artifacts. I guess Provisioner, theoretically, when we hit lands could help with Herald of Anguish. For that card to pop off. But I think we want more lifelinkers in the sky. So we want the Weird Sisters or Goshintai. This one gives us one lifelinking Pegasus. This one gives us the big Fiends of Darkest Night. I'm going to take the three Weird Sisters just right back to hand here. Okay. Johnny Strength of the Pride. That is a Heliod level... Uh, Life gain build around. Oh, I forgot it has that ability. Yep. All right. <laughs> Let's say the plus one and the minus are pretty good. Uh, the ultimate is literally just wrath. We've been wrathed this time. Brutal. It's a one sided wrath, too. Oof. Well, let's draw a card here, I guess. And then flip it next turn when we're ready to attack with it. We could make them kill Blood Artist, but we lose the sisters. Zhang Yingu. Doesn't do a whole ton here, but we might as well make the most of our mana. Not really that worried about them sniping Zhang Yangu. It's a dog eat villain world out there. Share in my strengths. Restoration Angel. Flicker the Blood Artist. Okay. Rambunctious Mutt. Destroy our Sanctum of Tranquil Light. They draw a card. We hit a land. I will help you through this. Well, we have a five six flying death touch lifelink. I guess our opponent gets to attack us with all and flip the legions landing if we attack in like this. Oops. Can we use this ability twice? I don't know. Is this tap for black? No. Only use it once. It's 
So we hit for six and they hit for six. And they can kill Zhang if they want to get rid of one plus and plus on counter. Looks like they don't mind. They have two cards in their library. <laughs> this Cosmos Elixir a May ability? It's not a May ability. They have to kill us next turn. Is it better to hold off as a blocker or attack in and life gain right now? I think it's better to attack in and life gain right now, because if we hold off as a blocker and they draw one sorcery speed removal spell, they kill Fiends of Darkest Night, we gain zero, we take three, four, five, six, seven, eight. I think we have to attack in and just gain as much life off this attack as we can, which is a good bit of life. And it's just, if they don't lethal us here, we win. Because they die in their end step, even? We didn't even have to untap. We go to 18 life here, deal 18 or lose? They do 8. They need to do 10 more damage. Oh my god! What on earth is today's Tinkerer's Cube Draft? We are two hours and 20 minutes into the recording session. Again, it's probably a little under two hours into the video free wall because I cut out the time between rounds and stuff. But uh, good lord, this is a lot of magic. Today's video is probably going to be a bit late. Five and two. Some wild games of magic too, some big back and forths, definitely just some drawn out games where I'm just making all kinds of misplays, just not even really knowing what's going on. But uh, we're finding ways, we're getting there with this weird, <laughs> this weird abs end deck. All right, five and two, getting all of our gold back, whatever happens from here, cannot be unhappy with a five two run in the Tinkerer's Cube. All right, here we are now in round eight. No black source, but Gilded Goose can help with that. I'm gonna go for it. Gilded Goose into a turn four Vona. Could be some spicy stuff. Vona's been a pretty scary card every time we've cast it. And Sanctum of Tranquil Light doesn't really do much for us by its lonesome, so I'm just gonna sit here and get more food for the Gilded Goose. That way, even after we cast Vona, we still have leftover food for our adorable goose to eat. Almost used the wrong ability. Just ate a food for no reason. Masked Vandal is the draw, so as soon as one of our creatures dies, we can blow up that animation module, which is a pretty scary card. This can sit there and for four mana, put a plus one plus one counter on creature and get a one one servo. So pretty scary card. Uh, we'll play the Sanctum of Tranquil Light though. We can still hold up our ability to make more food. Three mana up, Satessan Champion. I would love to kill that, but we have no removal here. So that's going to do some wild things, most likely. No fourth land drop, so we do not get to cast Vona here. That's pretty rough. I guess we just go for Provisioner and pass. Just needed to hit any land in the top three for this hand to pop off. Fortunately, didn't get there. And we might get max punish for it, because the Tessa Champion and Archon of Sun's Grace means they draw a single enchantment. Things are looking devastatingly bad for us. Alright, well, now we have Vona, Birch of Magan, Mana, and thanks to Tireless Provisioner giving us a treasure token here, we get to hold up our Snakeskin Veil while we do this. I think I'd rather use the Goose than the Treasure. Um, and hold the treasure up because we have three we have three food for the goose and only one treasure I'll two for one trade into an archon come on we know you want to do it Alright, 
<laughs> I was going to say, this attack looks kind of suspicious, but it's kind of easy to hide, too, because you just have food and, like, one random treasure. So, like, what could you possibly have? You're tapped out. Um, so we might actually be able to get the two-for-one trade. It's a two-for-one in their favor, but it gets rid of Archon before they start dropping enchantments, which is really important. Plus, it gets a creature in our grave, so our Masked Vandal gets to pop off. So that would have been so good for us if they took that trade, and unfortunately it didn't. So now they're going to cast an enchantment this turn, putting a counter on Satessin champion and getting a 2-2 pegasus in the sky and getting a 1-1 servo off of animation module if they want to spend a mana for that they just completely pop off here but as long as they don't use removal on vona we just start disassembling their board state one by one yeah, they're gonna gain five here that's pretty huge Okay. What are we doing here? I mean, Vona just attacks in, and if they try to do any good blocks, we can ruin them. So we just attack with Vona before anything else, I believe. Alright, well, snakes can veil that. How do they want to block here? They do not want to block. No chumps. So we'll just gain five. Do I want to kill their card draw engine first? The Satessan Champion. Or their big life linker, the Archon of Sun's Grace. Feel like I want to get rid of their card draw first. We can start controlling everything else. Well, we take a lot of damage in the sky here from Michiko's Reign of Truth. It's going to be one, two, three, plus three, plus three next turn on Archon of Sun's Grace. We take like six damage in the sky. I guess we can chump block with the goose. I really want to mask vandal Michiko's Reign of Truth, but we don't have a creature in her grave. I guess I could have let that pop off and kill Champion, then have Vona Engrave and use Vona Engrave to get rid of Mishko's Ranch Truth, but that's almost definitely wrong. Yeah, I guess we just get rid of the Flyer here. But we don't really want to chump block Champion on the ground either. Yeah, we're not going to want to chump block either, so we'll get rid of the card draw one. It's only one more damage, the Archon, than the Champion. And then we play Kodama, and we pass the turn. Choose the Pegasus token so they can attack both into Kodama. Fair enough. Take eight is a lot. That is a lot. Maybe I do chump block here with the Gilded Goose, which shuts up for Masked Vandal. Sure. We have Tireless Provisioner, hopefully filling the treasure roll that we need. Woodland Champion. As they get tokens, that'll get plus and plus on counters, and the Twin Blade Geist. So kind of just some random stuff there. Immediately punished. Immediately hit the double black card that is uncastable, because we only have one treasure. Vona is going to have to kill the Archon. Masked Vandal can kill the Reign of Truth. Vona has Trample here, so Vona probably... Gets us a land and a play tapped, which gives us the treasure token we need for the future. That's pretty cool. Yeah. 
They're going to block all because they know if we want to kill the Archon now, we can't save Vona. That's fine, right? Trade for Archon and kill their whole board state. And we can get Vona back from the grave later with Timeless Witness. We don't need Vona on the board anymore because it's costing us so much life to do anyway. We're not even going to be able to trigger it more often, I think. Yeah, I think we just let that happen. They're down to a single 2-2 flyer that we can block with Kodama. We do get to pull out a land here. Which means we get a treasure. We now play Masked Vandal to exile Mishiko's Reign of Truth, getting rid of our goose. Um, actually, we were probably supposed to hit the animation module, but they're both big targets. If they don't have a plus one plus one counter on one of their cards, the module doesn't do anything, so it might not work here. Um, and now what do we do? I think we just pass, and we're just going to eat a food during their turn. Because a 3-3 three, three reach is big enough to block even a 2-2 two, two flying double strike. Which is what they have on board. They have double strike, they have a 2-2 two, two flyer, that's it. Nettle cyst. That makes the flyer scarier for sure. Makes it a 4-4 four, four that we can't block well with Kodama. They don't have the mana to do that and give double strike right now. We just take the four for now so we can keep Kodama. Uh, but then we just have each player sack a creature with the Weird Sisters. And then they've got nothing, nothing in hand and no creatures on board. That sounds like a plan. Sounds like a plan for sure. Ooh, and we draw Sanctum of Stone Fangs, which is excellent, but not what we need right now. Um, so the Weird Sisters, we gotta do it pre-combat because of the way that it works. And then when we move to combat, make each player sacrifice a creature. And then feeling pretty good. They have to like draw into a creature here. I'm just going to eat another food rather than play the Sanctum right now. All right, Cleric class. That will eventually turn into a creature when they get to th that to level three. They pull a creature back out of their grave, and then we'll have to deal with a creature again. But for now, we're good. Okay, get another treasure here. Excellent. I can sink them stone fangs without using a treasure and timeless witness for whatever I want to play next turn. Which is probably some kind of removal. Mast Vandals, sweet. I should have just picked up Mast Vandal and done it this turn on Cleric class. I think I still just want Mast Vandal here, to be honest. Oh, we can do it right now with these treasures. Nice. Stumbling into the good plays. Except that Vona's gone now. That's kind of a thing. But I think it's okay. Alright, yeah, they scoop them up here. <sighs> really likely to get there in, in two turns. I believe that's five and two now. That is six and two. The best Tinkerer's Cube run I've had so far. Now we're heading into the final boss, win or lose. This will be a seven win run, our first one, or our first six win run, also pretty great. And a really long draft, whatever happens. We got our value out of this one for sure. Here we are in the final round. The final boss is here. I am going to keep this hand because it's got all three colors, but it is not going to let us cast Gideon. We need to draw some other early game action. Um, but I do get a turn two Sanctum of Stone Fangs. Uh-oh. Turn one Gutter Bones. Temple of Silence, scry me into the goodies. Uh, a Gonjo's good enough. We cast Gideon with that. Well, I don't know if it's good enough to win, but it's good enough to cast Gideon, so it's something. Oh, wow. Gideon is uh, just going to get eviscerated. 
as soon as Gideon touches the board, most likely. Because now they throw a dancing sword onto Gutterbones, make it a 4-2, attack Gideon for 4. Gideon will be at 5 loyalty, though, when we play him. But Mishiko's Reign of Truth means we just get Grand Slam for a million here. So I guess it's just holding onto a Ganjo to kill the Gutter Bones, which is going to flip the Dancing Sword, but it means that we don't just go to like zero here. By zero, I mean seven. Definitely better than casting a Gideon that they'll just ignore to put us to a very low life total. Cosmo Elixir as well, gain two and scry one in their end step, and then draw a card in their end step every turn from now on. Masked Vandal, but no creature in grave, no creatures in hand outside of the Vandal. Uh, please attack this Cheng Yangu instead of my face. I would appreciate it. It's kind of my only castable spell there. Uh, they did not take the ruse. <laughs> they did not attack the useless planeswalker. Ooh, double up on the sanctums. Gain more life now. It's a little bit of something. Well, we don't get to blow anything up because we don't have a creature in grave. But we get a blocker for their ground troops. Try to give us some more time for the Sanctums to drain them out, maybe. All right, a cleric class. I haven't seen any life gain. Oh, wait, no, we've seen the elixir from them. That's not going to gain life anymore. Uh, they are going to go ahead and kill Zhang Gangu here. Um, we can block all this portrait damage by using a snakeskin veil, which I think is worth it because we just don't have any other creatures to protect with the snakeskin veil anyway. Oh, tough lessons. Let's just keep our life total as padded as we can. Well, now we've got a creature protect. It's to protect, and it is Sithis, which is a pretty important one. Although, do we just want to tap something down with a Sanctum instead this turn? We've got the mana for it. It's going to cost us four. I guess probably Sithis doesn't actually do anything until we draw another enchantment, so we'll just use Sanctum to tap down a creature and take less damage. Naomi. They have an artifact and an enchantment, so Naomi spits out a creature. That is very good. I just realized we're never going to get anywhere with our Sanctum because Cosmos Elixir. It's just going to draw them a card anytime that the. Um, anytime that they're at a high life total. And when they're not, it's just going to bring them right back up to whatever the Sanctum hit them below. Which the Moors is a sweet draw, though. But we don't have any creatures in grave, but we can still get them to sacrifice stuff and get another blocker down. It's something. Sanctum is gaining us life, even if it isn't really damaging them when they have Cosmos Elixir down. Ooh. Elspeth. That's scary. Some 1-1 one -one tokens. Forsworn Paladin that can buff whatever they want. Probably send in two in the sky. They send in Naomi as well. Um, yeah, she does make a 2-2 every time. Well, Witch of the Moors is useless because we don't have creatures in Grave, and they're going to get two one ones and a 2-2 every turn, so it's better to just kill a Naomi with the Witch than try to get a bunch of value off of her. Because she's not going to get us any value. She's going to chip away at one of their three tokens produced every turn. Yeah, this is a game I probably should have just mulliganed. Because <laughs> the hand didn't really have much action. And, uh... If you're going to fight, fight beside me. Yeah, we are stumbling for it because our opponent's hand definitely had 
kind of snowballing action to start off with. Probably should have mulliganed this one. Also, the Gideon is really awkward in this matchup since we are on the defensive. The Gideon is actually not that great in this deck. I think I just got so tired of dying to Gideons that I overvalued him a bit. Really good on the aggressive, but do a whole ton on the defensive. Gideon was really scary in that one matchup um, against the longest game of the night that I've forgotten by now because there's been so many long games and I do not have great short-term memory. Well, there's Gideon mana, but we're super dead on board. Super duper dead. Six and three it will be. Unfortunately, I'm not able to trip all the way in to our first seven win run, but still a really good run for this deck in my opinion. I think that this... I'm just misreading the format in general, but this is one of the most awkward decks that I've drafted, and our losses certainly show that. Two of our losses being heavily... Uh, because of mana issues in a three color deck here that is running like double black cards and double white cards and double green cards the mana is really awkward and that was two of our losses and then our last loss there was just a really awkward hand with just like kind of enablers or payoffs and stuff just without any creatures there was like just like wasn't action in there but we had multiple colors of mana and we had castable spells so i was like tempted to keep it but it's like the spells just really don't don't do much on their loans some spells like jang yangu snakeskin veil and a sanctum you know uh showing off that our deck is also awkward and that you need to draw the right cards in conjunction with each other um so yeah really awkward deck here but wow when it comes together it comes together a six and three run here really nice run um the overperformers and underperformers I don't know if there's any very specific ones. Sithis didn't do as much as I wanted, but Sithis did pop off in a couple of our victories, but definitely Sithis was sitting on her hand doing nothing in some of the losses. Uh, but Captain Sisse was insane. Captain Sisse was a ridiculous card. Being able to consistently draw an, a powerful card every turn guaranteed, because you're always just drawing your next best legendary every turn, was absolutely absurd. Captain Sisse is super awesome. Very happy to, to say that. I guess the biggest underperformer would be Gideon. I don't think this is a, a Gideon deck, even though, again, lost to so many Gideons out of like Boros and Orzov decks. You just need that aggressive curve to go alongside your Gideon, either to have enough creatures to be out there to protect Gideon um, on blocks or just to have enough creatures to go alongside Gideon to get a lot of value off the plus one ability. Now, we still did some work with Gideon. I don't think that Gideon like shouldn't have been in the deck, but um, it was somewhat close to that point, and it's definitely at the point that I think I overdrafted um, the Gideon for this sort of three-color grindy strategy. Um, other than that, Gilded Goose was phenomenal. Gilded Goose alongside Herald of Anguish was insane. Herald of Anguish was phenomenal. Um, Vona was phenomenal. Witch of the Moors was great. Don't think there's any other cards that I could say that highly underperformed or highly overperformed. That was, uh, those are the main ones. Um, but yeah, pretty fun deck. Great run overall. Six and three. I'll take it. Going to be a great prize for today's draft. But that is going to end the video. As always, if you're interested in seeing some more of this limited content, stick around on the channel. I do these draft videos almost every day, just as soon as I, or as soon, as often as I can. We'll be back again with more Tinkerer's Cube drafts very soon. We will, of course, be playing Streets of New Co Streets of New Capenna all the time when that set launches on Arena next Thursday. And, uh, yeah, that's pretty much it. Lots of great stuff on the horizon. As always, I'd like to thank you all very much for watching, and I will see you again soon for some more Magic Arena.